I've lost six people over the years, and uh, two were the electric chair, two were the gas chamber, and two were the um, lethal injection. You know, if people say it doesn't make any difference, as the electric chair, just disgusting that you put 2,400 volts of electricity through someone's head. When was the first time you learned about the death penalty? Well, I had seen in a history book um, Joan of Arc being burned at the stake. Um, so I thought, oh, this is really barbaric. I mean, her only crime is to beat the English in a few battles, you know? So I was really impacted by that. And then I decided when I was about 16 to write a history essay about the death penalty. And it came as a big surprise to me that um, that they were still doing it in America. I thought I'd just go and sort them out and teach them that it was wrong. And how was your journey to, to doing that? Well, you know, they have a plan for young people, mm -hmm. and that plan very often is not what you want to do. And the plan for me was to go study science at Cambridge. I don't know, I'm not interested in science. I mean, my A-levels were physics, chemistry, maths, and further maths, and I just find that incredibly boring. And I went to Cambridge the next week and said, I'm not coming to Cambridge. I'm going to go to America and do what I want to do. And this guy in a tweed jacket said, oh, this is the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your life. I said, I bet it's not. And so I went to America instead. And what was your first experience of death row like? Can you talk me through like, what was going through your mind when you walked and, and met those prisoners? And Oh, I remember it very vividly. It was a place called Reedsville, yeah. Georgia, where the Georgia State Prison was. I was down visiting people on death row when I was about 20. And look, it was the summer of my second year of college and university in America. And really, I was only useful for one thing, which was to go visit the prisoners. And I remember I was going into Reedsville, Georgia State Prison, and I was thinking, what am I going to talk to these guys about? And why do they want to talk to me? I mean, it must be miserable on death row, and here am I coming in to talk about my, my incredibly fortunate life. And I went in, and oh, it was just great. I mean, you know, most of my best friends over the years have been people on death row, let's face it. Uh, this notion that you shouldn't have an emotional attachment to your clients, just stupid. Uh, of course you should. I know some lawyers take the approach that you don't have a relationship. Why do you think that that's a, a nice way to, to approach it? What, what is it about oh, how that? how nice, nice. I'm not Why? sure nice is the word I'd use for it. No, it's because it's the only human way to do it. When you're representing someone in front of a jury, if you don't like them or if you're not friends with them, that's going to come across. And I normally would spend about three years preparing for a trial because it takes a lot of work. And by then, you've really got to know the person. And we are all better than our worst 15 minutes. What were the ways in which the US government were inflicting capital punishment? Because it was varied at the time, and I know it's changed a bit. Still is stuff. varied. I mean, look, I've lost six people over the years, and uh, two were the electric chair, two were the gas chamber, and two were the um, lethal injection. And, you know, if people say it doesn't make any difference, as the electric chair, just disgusting that you put 2,400 volts of electricity through someone's head. And, you know, Nicky Ingram, he and I were born in the same hospital, Addenbrooke's in Cambridge. And um, I had to watch him die. And I liked Nicky. We'd been friends for 12 years when they killed him. And he, first, I mean, oh God, you know they go through all that nonsense about last meals. And Nicky said, I don't want a last meal because you're about to kill me. And he said, I want a last cigarette. So I ask if they give him a last cigarette and they say, no, because it's bad for his health. And I say, you've got to be kidding me. You're planning to kill this poor guy. So I went out and told the media and that they were humiliated by that. So they gave him a last cigarette. But then they shave his head, shave his leg and put, you know, 2,400 volts through him. It's just disgusting. It's not easy after Nikki's execution. I mean, I still have PTSD from that. If I close my eyes right now, I can see the black and white of him being electrocuted right in front of me. It's horrible. And it's not a quick process, is it? I've, I've... No. 
it, it's really inhumane in the sense of the time that it takes. Yeah, and you know, Jesse Tafaro is headquartered on fire because uh, the guards didn't like him, so they didn't put the right stuff. And so, yeah, it takes a lot longer. It took, Nicky wasn't killed by the first round of electricity, yeah. And then there's the gas chamber. Edward Johnson, the first person I lost, um, was 1987, and I was very young, and I really didn't know what I was doing. And if I knew today, I mean, if I knew then what I know today, he'd be alive. And he was innocent, and it really, ugh. But they gassed him in the gas chamber, and that was Zyklon B, the stuff they used in Auschwitz. Now, you know, I'm half Jewish myself. I don't think you have to be half Jewish to figure out that's not a nice thing. And indeed, I, I walked into the gas chamber with him. Um, it was just horrible. And then, you know, lethal injection's no better. I mean, they, because they have people who aren't doctors doing it, so they can't find a vein and they stick things around for up to an hour trying to find a vein before they do that. And then they screw it up all the time. So it's all bad. There's not, if you ask me which way I want to be executed, it's of old age, you can execute me of old age by giving me too much gin just when I'm you know, about to become uh, incompetent and that'll be fine. That's what I'm gonna do anyhow. So, you know, I don't need them to do it to me. What's going through the minds of the people you're working with in the lead up to their execution? What's that process like for them and how does it? Well, it varies hugely. I mean, the, I just wrote a book about my dad and Larry Launcher mm. because both dad and Larry were what we call bipolar. So Larry was in prison because he was accused of killing three people. Um, Larry had a gambling problem. It's all illegal gambling in Georgia, so he ends up $10,000 in debt to this illegal gambling outfit. And according to the prosecution, he pretends to be an FBI agent and goes in there and ends up shooting them all. That's not what happened. I, I can't tell you exactly what happened because it's privileged even after death. Um, but let's just say he was covering for someone who did it. Um, but, you know, he was involved, so he would have got uh, life, but he shouldn't have got death. And Larry tried to get himself executed several times. Over eight years, I represented him. He would try to commit suicide by electric chair, and I would try and talk him out of it each time. And we came within 40 minutes of his execution four times. And once we got it stopped with 58 seconds left to go, I was on the phone to the US Supreme Court, and the nice clerk there said, can you wait a minute? And I said, no, we don't have a minute. So, um, so that was pretty traumatic. But Larry, through all the first time, just wanted to take his own life. By, by the time we got to the fifth time, when I couldn't stop it, he had got Christianity and he really believed and he really thought he was going to heaven. And so um, he was very different. I mean, he honestly went to the electric chair utterly happy. And when they asked him uh, for a last statement, he said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do, which is what Jesus supposedly said on the cross. So, um, you know, that's, that was fabulous, actually, because I couldn't make his life better, really, because he was going to be locked up forever, even if we got the death penalty knocked off. Uh, and Larry just couldn't deal with that. Um, and I couldn't stop it, and I was there for his execution, and he was just incredibly generous. Um, and you know, Larry wasn't a choir boy, but, um, but he didn't do what they said he did. But um, yeah, so they're very different. Now, some people are terrified, as they should be, but it's all just so barbaric, and it's always the middle of the night, and you always come out of the execution chamber, and you look up at the stars and think, Jesus, did that really make the world a better place? I read that you always go to the um, execution of, of clients that do get to that, that point. And wh why is that? Well, someone's got to be there as their friend. And if it's not me, who's it going to be? What is it like in that space? Is it clinical? Is it emotional? Oh, is it emotional? It is for me. But um, no, it's not clinical. They try to make it clinical by having your last words, your last meal, your last prayer. But that's all for the people who are doing this stuff. And, you know, look, I've had over 400 
people I've represented on that, and six of them got killed. So, you know, you, I, I don't dwell on that because I've got to prevent it in 98% of the cases. And why do you think that, or why do you find that working with innocent people is more difficult than people that are guilty of it? No, it's not more difficult, it's just sort of boring. Um, first, if you ask an innocent person, like I asked you, did you murder the Moo Youngs on October the 16th, 1986? Well, who did then? I don't know. See, you're useless. You're totally useless. I mean, if you did it, you could help me out, but you're useless. But actually, innocent people are dangerous in many other ways. Um, innocent people think that no one could possibly convict them because they know they didn't do it. So how's 12 people going to say you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? So they make immensely bad decisions. Chris Maharaj, a great case in point, very intelligent guy, businessman, couldn't believe anyone would convict him. So when his idiot defense lawyer told him not to put his six alibi witnesses on, he said, oh, fine, why do I need them? No one could convict me. When the defense lawyer said, don't take the witness stand to say you're innocent, he went along with it. And then the jury comes along and convicts him and he fainted which is sort of as strong evidence that he didn't do it as anything. But innocent people make very stupid decisions because they just can't imagine. So, you know, I'm not, I really don't like that. I think it's interesting to understand what the worst thing someone did and then try to mitigate it and try to get people to understand that's human. But it's not very interesting just who done it. I mean, just from my perspective, I mean, I've represented lots of innocent people, don't get me wrong, and you know, I'm glad to get them off, but, um, but it's not very interesting. And do you feel that the US will ever abolish capital punishment? Of course they will. The only issue is whether they do it while I'm still alive. How close is it to being abolished? What's the work to do before? I mean, look, actually, we're winning. We're winning massively, and if you look over my career, um, it's gone down hugely. We were sentencing, you know, two or three hundred people to death each year. Now it was down to about ten last year. The problem is this, that the Supreme Court, because there are six Catholics on the Supreme Court and they all listen to the Pope about abortion, but they don't listen to the Pope about the death penalty, um, the six right-wingers, or fascists as I prefer to term them, um, are very much in favor of the death penalty, just as the people of America are becoming against it. So there are 2,600 people on death row. The Supreme Court wants to kill them all. Um, and there's going to be a bit of a bloodbath, I think, because I don't think we're going to be able to stop them um, doing some bad stuff. But I have a project called the Postmortem Project where I'm representing 187 dead people. It's really cool. No one complains about my representation. No, no, it's because I want to prove that we've executed innocent people. And I thought when I started that project that it would be really hard to prove many, but you begin by looking at the last words. And if your last words were, I'm really sorry I killed six people, probably not. But a huge number, the last words, my favorite was this guy in Missouri, whose last words were, you're about to execute an innocent person and you can kiss my ass. But a huge number said something to the effect that you're about to kill an innocent person and that's not because they're making it up. And as we've looked at these cases uh, and done the investigation post-mortem that should have been done when they were still alive and then we we'll put it on TV and that, we can prove a huge number of innocent people were killed and that's what's going to stop the death penalty just as it did in Britain in about 60 years ago when we killed a few innocent people. What is the percentage of people that are executed on death row that are innocent? Is there a... Well, according to my yeah. work at the moment, it's about 13%. So, you know, that means that in one time out of eight or so, we're killing the wrong person. But where you do your job right, I mean, we were able to exonerate more people in Louisiana, where I worked for 10 years, than they executed. So there, they were batting a 50% error rate. I believe in your early career, you met Ted Bundy as well. Ted Bundy was, I, I met him in the Florida State Prison, and he was just wacko jacko. Ted Bundy, as people may not remember his case, because it's a long time ago, and I met him way back in the um, 
in like 1980, 81, something like that, 80 or 81. And he was portrayed as a suave, intelligent person. There was a whole issue about whether he even understood he was going to be executed because he was genuinely crazy. And, you know, one thing I wish is, you know, I was only a student then, so I have no insight really. Um, but I wish I'd had a chance to really delve into why he did that sort of thing and what, what it was, because that's the way we're going to stop it in the future. I would like to talk a little bit about how you came to work with um, people in Guantanamo Bay. So, well, the thing is, the US government took the position that after 9-11, there's a terrible thing about America. We're going to show how tough we are, so we're going to lock all these, the worst of the worst terrorists in the world, right? And that's what they said. They were the worst of the worst terrorists in the world. But, you know, that was the beginning, and it was really hostile back then. And, you know, the truth is it was hostile in Europe, too. The Europeans were all against us. And I called around all my death penalty friends, and they just didn't want to do it. And this was very much post 9-11. And I underestimated the emotional impact on Americans of 9-11. And it took us two and a half years to get in there. But we got in eventually. And I went down there thinking, oh, you know, these are a bunch of terrorists. I'm going to have a hard time explaining why they were in Afghanistan. And whether that's America's business or not, still. I get down there and I'm having a terrible time finding an honest-to-goodness terrorist. Really, it was dreadful. The, the Mohammed al Gharani, 14 years old. Now, he said he was 14, but the Americans didn't believe him. And so I asked the CIA guys, I say, well, how would you prove how old someone was? And they start talking about your dental records. Why don't you just go get his birth certificate? And so we sent off for his birth certificate, and sure enough, it showed he was 14 years old. And he was stuck in Guantanamo because they thought he was an Al-Qaeda financier, and this is how it came about. They were interrogating him, and he spoke Saudi Arabic, and they, the Americans couldn't speak Arabic, so they used a Yemeni translator. And in Yemeni Arabic, the word zalat means money. In Saudi Arabic, it means salad, salad. <laughs> So they're interrogating this kid and they say, when you went to Pakistan, what zalat did you have? And he thinks these people are idiots. And he said, I don't have any zalat. And they, they're talking about money, he's talking about tomatoes. And so they say, you had to have zalat. And he said, no, I could get zalat anywhere I wanted it in, in Karachi. And they say, oh, where could you get zalat in Karachi? And they think he's talking about money again. So they think he's an Al-Qaeda financier he lists a series of vegetable stalls in Karachi, and they wrote this down. And then they accused him of being an Al-Qaeda financier. And as long as he didn't have a lawyer, there was no way he could disprove it. And then I got in to see him and, you know, oh my goodness. And there were so many of those stories. Yeah. I mean, they're just mad. But it is a true tribute, I think, to the power of the American system that we were able to sue and we won in the Supreme Court, that you just can't lock people up without any sort of due process. And so we've now released 750 of the 780 prisoners. And then there's another 17 who are cleared for release. So that means that they've got it wrong over 98% of the time. And obviously the, the thing that most people I think associate with Guantanamo Bay is, is waterboarding and that the kind of torture that goes on there. What was happening when you were in Guantanamo, when you were first going, and, and at the start, what was happening behind closed doors in Guantanamo Bay? Was it waterboarding and, and more? Yeah, when I was first down there, there was all sorts of bad stuff going on. That was, I got in in 2004, and I would talk to these guys, and honestly, you know, I talked to Benyam Mohammed, a British person from not far from here in London, and he starts telling me about being taken they thought he was a dirty bomber and they had tortured him about whether he had ever learned how to build a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. And he had said, no, no, no. He tells me for three days about being taken to Morocco where they took a razor blade to his genitals every, um, every two weeks for a year and a half. And then he was taken to the dark prison in Afghanistan where they played loud music at him um, and it was, what I loved about Binyam is he knew all the songs and, you know, he had Eminem 
um, played Adam forever and so forth. And Binyam is the uh, expert in this. And he says, look, razor blade, you knew when it was going to start, you knew when it was going to end, it was painful, but at least you knew that. The problem with the music was it was designed to drive you mad and you could feel your mind slipping away. I came out of talking to Binyam Mohammed, and I thought I was suffering from PTSD. And you just think what he's going through is just insanity. And that's, you know, this is one of the many things I learned about torture that I never really wanted to know, that we in 2001, the Americans, just totally lost our minds and thought that we were going to somehow make the world a better place by torturing people. And I, I think my job was simply to tell the world what was going on. Uh, and our principle with Guantanamo was if we open it up to public inspection, they'll close it down because the world will see what anathema it is. But that hasn't happened. No, it, ha it has. I mean, we've won the battle. George Bush says it was a mistake. There are only 30 people left there now. And, you know, compared to most battles, we've got 95% of them out. It's amazing. How many people have you represented um, from Guantanamo Bay? I've had 87 people there and 85 are out. And the last two will be out soon. Amazing. Yeah, it's great. It's, you see, that's what I love about my job. I get to get them out, and then I get to go visit them back at their homes. And the U.S. government did say that it would shut Guantanamo. I think it was was it 15 years ago. Yeah, it was on. It was January the 21st, 2009. Yeah. And how close is it to being shut down? Do you think? Oh, I don't know if it'll. I think it'll just be shut down in my life if I outlive Halid Sheikh Mohammed but it won't be shut down for quite a while. Why? Because the nutty Republicans want to keep it open as if it's doing the world any good. I mean, it's a stain on, uh, on America's reputation that ought to be closed tomorrow, but I don't think it will be. What are the biggest threats to human rights at the moment for us? If you look around Europe to all of your populist leaders, and you've got Maloney in Italy, you've got Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, all of these people playing on hatred. Um, and that's classic, isn't it? It's what politicians do when they don't have any ideals. And so you've got Trump in America, and it's so easy to get people to hate, uh, and it's actually not so easy to get people to be decent to each other. But what the powerful people do is always play the poor people off against each other so that no one notices they're the problem. And that's the essence of the politics of fear and the politics of hatred. Now, I know what your ideal world is. I don't have to grill you on that because your ideal world and everyone in this room is exactly the same. And our ideal world obviously doesn't have prisons in it. It doesn't have torture in it. It doesn't have poverty. It doesn't have a lack of uh, education or a lack of, of healthcare and all that. So we know what our ideal is. And actually life is very, very simple. Every decision you ever make should take you closer to your ideal. Um, but when people don't have ideals, that's when they get in a big old muddle and they think we need to have less immigration, we need to have more prisons, which is just madness. And so all of our lives just have to be about that. And if you don't do that, you go directly to hell. Now, that used to be a great threat, but if you don't believe in hell, it loses its bite, doesn't it? If we just say, oh, he's an evil guy, then we don't understand at all, and this is going to happen again. You mentioned when we spoke initially that what's really interesting about your work is that it's often not about law, but about power. Mm, Can you tell me a bit about that? I thought well, it's all about power. I mean. I've been put on trial for contempt of court a few times, and while I've been acquitted each time, I really have very little but contempt for the legal system. I think it's a hopeless way to resolve people's disputes. And, I, and, I, and it's about power. It's about a powerless person needing power on her or his side. And um, so I suppose if you look at Guantanamo, that's a good illustration. In the history of Guantanamo Bay, we got 750 people out and the courts have ordered the release of two. 
And the other 748 we've got out by getting the truth out, publicizing it to the world and embarrassing the hell out of the government. So the journalism has much more power. The court of public opinion is much more effective than the court of law. The court of law is presided over by a bunch of judges who basically I went to school with and they were twits then and they're twits now. Sorry, but that's just the way it is as a massive generalization. The court of public opinion is run by people. And at root, the people who don't take themselves seriously like the judges do are, are much easier to persuade to do the right thing. So, and there are, there are ways to do that that are just sort of interesting. So we can get people to do the right thing much easier than judges. What's the proudest moment of your career, Clive? Seriously, I don't know. It's hard to say. There have been lots of things. I'm, you know, pride, we should just preface it's a deadly sin. Um, but but uh, the thing I'm actually most proud of was being there for Larry Launcher. I was driving down to his execution and um, Emily, my wife and I, we stopped off at a gas station to get him on the phone. And so I get Larry on the phone and I say, how are you doing, Larry? And he's set to die in two and a half hours, right? And he says, all right, Clive, you can pick up my appeals again. So I run off to get on the phone with the judge and the attorney general. He's outside the toilet in this gas station with these American truckers with their coveralls and their chewing tobacco and all the rest of it coming by all the time. And I'm arguing with the judge. Um, and Emily's still on the phone with Larry. And Larry said this, and this was the kindest thing anyone's ever said. He said, um, well, good. I know he won't be able to stop it, but I had to give him one last chance because he's the only friend I've ever had. When Larry told me that I was the only friend he'd had, that's the proudest moment in my life, to have been able to be that. Uh, and why? Because, he, because I was, he told me I was his friend. And that came spontaneously and genuinely. And um, what more could you really ask? No lights are on in the house, and we always left the light on if I'm out. And um, walked in. I have a man stretched out on my floor. I checked him, and he was dead. Under no way that I could see was I not going to jail.